quote, what is the definition of love? Love is accepting all things as it is just the way it is. When you're in that big L love, there's no codependency. You are love. And a lot of people arise from rock bottom because rock bottom is where there's no more energy to keep the egoic structure intact. Fear gives you limited choices. Love gives you infinite choices. A heart that's wide open can never be broken. It's already broken open. How do you stay open enough to navigate the process instead of contracting? Don't react, don't resist, don't engage at the level of the mind and just feel. And those four steps can take you all the way home. Hi, and welcome to the Heart Leader Podcast, where our heart and our mind align. I'm your host, Amber, and I am very excited to introduce the first part of a two-part series with Dr. Wesley Kress. Dr. Kress is a board-certified acupuncturist and a specialist when it comes to optimizing human performance. And he comes to us with a wealth of knowledge, not only about how the body works, but about how the spirit works as well. In this first episode of Embracing Love Over Fear, Dr. Kress and I dive deep into the interplay between love and fear in personal transformation. It is truly a life-changing discussion. So when we just sat here and talked, we dove into like the very deep topic of love as like a whole and your willingness to just dive right into that is amazing because for many people, that is a topic that it's easier to talk about fear mm -hmm. than it is to talk about love. So how did you get to a space where love doesn't scare you? Yeah. It's it's great because those two are sort of like opposing ends, right? Uh, one is probably like the furthest end of contraction and love is like the furthest end of expansion. And obviously through the nature of uh, life, it sort of reveals to us uh, the nature of, of love and our interpretation of it changes over time. That's certainly been my, my experience personally. And, you know, what I thought was... Uh, Sort of fear was just an illusion of separation of, of self and others. And so the nature of speaking about love is, is much easier uh, at this point. And sort of uh, the ability to honor where we are on the path, uh, wherever we are, is a key element of love because we can't be anywhere where we are not. And the difference is actually what creates the fear. So our ability to think that we need to perform or to be something in the nature of the mind that we have conceived as to be safe is to precipitate fear, which is a form of separation from the authentic self. And we forget this. Uh, it's sort of why, like, you know, you go back to children and why most spiritual or religious contexts go back and think that... Uh, Essentially, we're going through this process of being born again, to be childlike, but to be with wisdom and clarity accompanying that childlike nature. And children are what you would say is fearless. You know, they sort of discover life, they engage life with just this openness of love, which is just to accept all things as it is, just the way it is. They don't have a sense of conditioning, they don't have a sense of separateness that's something that comes after right yeah. uh, and that is what creates the nature of fear and so through that is you know in the beginning natures of domestication by parents by society by the collective is we learn to need to be something other than what we are yeah. and so that that's essentially uh why we suffer um and that difference is the degree of sort of invalidation of what we're feeling inside. So say you're four or five years old and you go to your mother or your father and you're feeling some sort of experience of emotions and they communicate that you should feel something other than that. Maybe because of the nature of that being one of the shadow emotions, may it be it fear, anxiety, shame, guilt, sadness, uh, some of the areas of contraction. And through that, you think that you need to be something different. 
So you start to perform as if that feeling is not real. And that comes out as our personality or what most would say is our egoic structure, right? And it's just there to keep us safe, meaning that there is an authority figure uh, or someone above us in this new terrain that we're experiencing that's told us that uh, what we're feeling is not valid. Yeah. So the ability to reconnect with ourself is the whole healing process and to allow the dissolving of the mind and to come back to the nature of the authentic self, which is to feel. You know, if I were to encompass, like, well, what is the definition of love? Love is accepting all things as it is just the way it is. And that is essentially what grace is, right? To receive someone without uh, the need for them to be anything other than what they are. Come as you are. Yeah. And so that's more or less the capital L love. Uh, the small L love is a lot of the conditionings that we learn to behave as if we are actually practicing love uh, and what we learn to be safe. And so this idea of needing to be something that we're not, which is like maybe to be on, <laughs> it's just to be triggered, uh, is to go away from the authentic self, right? It's to go into performance. Um, and this is uh, often the time where most people experience this sense of being unsafe in the body um, because they've been told that something what they're feeling is, is not right or not actually accepted in the nature of the world. And so, yeah, that's where it arises from. And when you're in that space of, of the capital L love, you can allow all things to just be exactly as they are. And through that, um, our own mirror helps others heal. And that's essentially why we're here, <laughs> is to help mirror back the light that's within all of us. And we're at different points of the journey of that experience. And that is part of what helps create liberation, meaning everyone is seeking the freedom from, they just don't know it. And that freedom from is the freedom suffering. Um, and that fear is that resistance to those things that could hurt us. The illusion is that any amount of protection doesn't allow us to experience safety, right? Um, because if you're protecting, how could you possibly be feeling safe, you yeah. know, and expansive? And we often talk about, I love that little L love versus big L love, because when we're in little L love, often we're attempting to love ourselves through someone else. Yes. But then all you're going to get is the level of love that that person is able to filter through to give back to you. Yes. So you're never really going to receive the fullest amount of love. Yes. And when you're in that big L love, there's no codependency. You are love. Yes. And so you are so full with, with love that it is spilling out to everyone and everything around you. And so there's no codependent nature yes. to that. Yes. Exactly. And that's at all of us at our authentic core is just this. And so a lot of this whole path is just your remembering, yeah. uh, a dissolving of the nature of uh, the illusions that keep us from that experience in perpetuity, right? So this ongoing experience of just our authentic core nature. And of course, depending on the degree of, of trauma, which whether it be small T trauma or large T trauma, that one is limited in terms of the nature of that experience of that truest essence, which is just uh, love. And so we think we have to go and do something to, to find it, only to come back and remember that <laughs> actually it's uh, something so close to us that uh, any idea of trying to get it uh, was sort of a misperception or an illusion. And just to speak to your point that essentially, yeah, the uh, romantic side of, you know, exchange with someone is like a biggest teacher of the capital L love. It's why like the people closest to us hurt us the most, so to speak, but that hurting or triggering is actually just a mirroring back of the areas within us that still need love, right? Meaning acceptance of ourselves, right? And so the people I say that hurt us or trigger us the most are also the person walking us back home into the nature of 
authentic self, which is the capital L love. And so in many ways, it's like everything is in essence a mirror, right? In the nature of reality and helping reflect back to the truths. And the more we can stay in the nature of openness and curiosity and receptivity, the, the easier it is to walk the path, right? Meaning the moment we go into contraction, which would be like fear, and we close down, is that essentially what happens in the nature of like an open heart, right? The moment you close it, you get it broken. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, a heart that's wide open can never be broken. It's already broken open. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> but often the fear I have found with individuals as they start to break open, they've become so comfortable in the contraction. Mm -hmm. That to feel so expansive feels unruly. Yeah. It is too much, just way too much. And so they begin to go back to what feels comfortable. It's almost like being confined by a blanket or something, right? It, yes. They want to wrap themselves back up in the comfort of that. You've navigated through that. You've found your way from space where when we talked you had mentioned like you've navigated all of these things in life to a space now where being expansive in the present moment nonstop has mm -hmm. become your way of life yeah so how can you go from one space of okay this was my life and this is what happened to me which is often instead of this is what happened with me i this was my path it mm -hmm. led me, and that is the, it happened with me versus it happened to me, and that goes to the little T, big T. These are traumas. They're cutting, they're cutting, they're cutting to how do you get to, okay, this was something I used to get to a point where I could open myself up. These cuts were actually breaking me open so that I could feel where I'm at. Yes. Right. Yes. Uh, yeah, the process, right? Yes. You know, I would say information doesn't equal transformation. Oftentimes, the nature of content of a lot of really powerful books along my own path at the level of the mind or the intellect was something beautiful. It like took me into a nature of dreaming about what could be, but it sort of fell short in terms of the integration of transformation. I think that's what you're speaking to with reference to the nature of like, as you move into expansion, there's sort of this familiarity with contraction because in all essence, the whole reason that we have that is for survival. So I would say evolution and self-realization or spirituality is sort of looking back at each other, right? And sort of they're mirroring each other. And so what you're speaking to in terms of the nature of familiarity is familiarity breeds safety. Right, so that's why marketers spend billions of dollars on the nature of exposure, is if you've seen it enough and you've survived, it must be safe. Yes. It doesn't mean that it's safe. It's meaning that at the layer of the mind, it's safe because you survived. So this just goes back to the nature of why we constantly go back into unhealthy patterns, is because we've survived in those unhealthy patterns, meaning they kept us safe at the layer of the mind. Right. So be able to drop below that is where the process of transformation takes place. And understanding the distinction is where all the healing is. And so most of us are in the familiarity and intimacy of the mind. And we think it's the same as the nature of like the somatic or the body and the heart. And you don't know what you don't know. Right. So most people are still trying to, uh, achieve or experience the nature of healing at the layer of the mind. And this was my path as well. So the intimacy with the layer of the mind is, is pretty strong uh, just because of my early trauma where it was so significant and so profound that the only safety was left in the mind. And so I tried to construct, as, as most people do, as they move to the layer of what they think could be safe and try to figure it all out. 
which is like this hyper-intellectualization of the nature of reality. So if I just figure out reality at the nature of the mind, then of course uh, I'll be safe, right? Like I'll figure it all out. But the ultimate truth doesn't lie at the layer of the mind. In fact, uh, the layer of the mind can't actually know truth. And that's what I actually fully understood as I went to the edge of the mind, is that there was a limitation in it. And to know something in terms of everything that it's not is you can sort of start to know the opposite side. And so my journey very much went through deep depths of suffering because the old saying is like, the more you know, the more you suffer, right? And some people will say, oh, ignorance is bliss. And I'll say that until the freight train hits you in the face, right? So ultimately... You know, ignorance is more of a reflection of the nature of like how much of our subconscious hasn't been brought to consciousness, meaning brought to the light. And so we can choose to take our light and shine it within ourselves. And through that, that can help us reveal the nature of the unconscious patterns of suffering that we have. That's sort of like the very first steps of the awakening process, right? It's sort of you wake up to these truths and then you clean up, meaning you sort of like are aware now of what needs to be changed and then you grow up and this sort of happens in perpetuity. And so to bridge that gap, like what are the processes that one has to like go through in order to sort of like reduce the patterns of engaging with the contractions is there's many different tools that people can utilize as a means of uh, eliciting this sort of expansive nature. And a lot of it is more in the doing than it is in the learning. And so it's actually an unlearning. (laughs) And so that. that is where I think a lot get hung up. And I would say suffer a lot. Um, and I would certainly say that for myself, that was part of the experience as well. It was like, you know, I knew uh, almost too much. And part of why when people ask me about these topics today, and I can articulate them very well, is simply because of the nature of like understanding the roadmap in intricate detail before ever the transformative process occurred. You know, um, and so, there's uh there's both a value <laughs> and uh all forms of contraction have value meaning walking through fear and shame and guilt is where all wisdom comes from like it doesn't come from the light yeah. right uh the darkness uh actually is what precipitates the light so if you go to a darkness retreat and you sit in a darkness retreat for like say 7 days 10 days 14 days you start to see the light right yeah. and that light is within all of us And so the whole challenging process of this is actually because we're wired to move away from pain. And I would say that pain is a representation of these sort of patterns, right, of resistances of the shadow. And so, you know, where there is an ability to feel like you're moving in a direction away from things is to actually look back. And so if you feel some form of resistance to something, that's where you need to look. Yeah. Uh, and that's obviously uncomfortable. And the best knowledge is like a cold plunge, you know, no one ever really wants to go into a cold plunge, right? Uh, but you do it anyways. And so in the same way that no one really wants to look at these pieces within themselves, there's a higher order of recognizing that you anything on the self-realization path or the healing path is front loaded in pain meaning the highest intensities up front and then the biggest payoffs on the other side and that's where the word devotion (laughs) faith and trust come in is like those words were just ways of conceptualizing this piece is you sort of have to have some degree of faith and trust and surrender and devotion uh, to go through your own pain to get on the other side And whereas the other side, which is the form of contraction, is to utilize things that appear expansionary, and they are, but temporarily and unsustainably. So all forms of like dopaminergic mediated drugs like cocaine or heroin or alcohol 
or even the nature of the mind, which is like a form of escapism, are kind of like front loaded in the nature of like being able to deliver some form of what feels like expansion, meaning they're using your own light to give you that experience on your time, right? But they come so at a great cost, right? To your long-term expansion of love because they are actually the same analogy of stepping over a dollar to pick up a penny, (laughs) right? Is that you get the experience in the moment, but then it takes away more of that light. Eventually you get to rock bottom where it takes away everything in your life, including itself. And then you're left with the ability to see all things as it is, just the way it is. And a lot of people arise from rock bottom because rock bottom is where there's no more energy to keep the egoic structure intact. Because it takes a lot of energy to keep it intact. And for us to see things with clarity is to actually be able to let go of the nature of the egoic structure, which is our personality that arose trying to keep us safe and ultimately was just leading us down a path of self-realization and self-discovery. So it's not that that side is bad or inherently wrong. In fact, the people who have gone the furthest down suffering and pain typically have extracted, if they go all the way through and the other side, have extracted the most wisdom and clarity. So it's, you know, you're always where you need to be. Uh, It's just uh, our ability to be present with that and to lean into the areas of pain and uncomfortability so that we can expand on the other side is the practice of transformation that is needed. So the ability to feel, if we were to lay out four steps in terms of the nature of like what, what is the process that someone needs to do? They don't know anything about the nature of spirituality. Or really, I like the word Mm -hmm. self-realization because spirituality is the core operating system of everything. So Everything collapses into spirituality, meaning self-realization. And so those four things is uh, essentially don't react, don't resist, don't engage at the level of the mind, and just feel. And those four steps can take you all the way home. Uh, and the reason that is, is all of the things above that is just conditioning and reaction is a reactivation of some form of conditioning that we haven't felt, right? So the order of magnitude of that is depending on the iceberg, how deep is that iceberg of anger, fear, or sadness. And if we feel, if we don't react, we don't resist, we don't love, engage at the level of the mind, meaning the mind will have a narrative or story about the sensations you're feeling. Um, and you, you can't control that. Yeah. And the point is not to control it. Exactly. Right? For some reason, reason, individuals have this concept that when I'm in big L love, I don't have a fear ever. Yeah. So I, <laughs> I would say, um, And this is the tricky part is like along the path, there's a lot of ammunition that the mind gets, you know, as you learn more at the level of the intellect. And this is where it's like challenging. I think some people that are like very intellectually driven, such as myself and others and going through this path is you can start to project like where you should be very quickly Mm -hmm. versus where you are. And I would say that, Yes, at the furthest end of wholeness, there is a sort of dissolving of the nature of fear, and, and there is like a fearlessness, and most of the path requires a lot of courage. Um, and that's sort of leaning into the nature of things. And so there is a truth there uh, in terms of the nature of like there not being a direct experience in the nature of fear in the same way. Um, that you used to experience it because the reason is that everything collapses into the nature of experience of fullness. And so but it's like, you don't know what you don't know. And so like, if you were to ask me this, you know, just a year ago or two years ago, I would have said, well, I experienced the nature of fear um, and just sort of move into it, you know? At the state, I'm most of my experience at this point is yeah, I don't experience it, um, but it's it's a little bit challenging for me to even express that because I do know like when a mind is sort of 
hearing that, it starts to gravitate. Well, like, I wish I should be there, or I should be there, or I need to, my experience needs to be just fearlessness. I mean, honestly, that's why people take drugs, right? Is like this ability to create an altered state of consciousness. Like alcohol, for instance, like numbs people so like they don't necessarily feel fear the same way. Right? They move into a state of expansion, right? It's a form of altered consciousness, but it comes at the cost of contraction of the body. And so the key is to where like all things are aligned at the end, which is like the heart, <laughs> the the mind, the body, and the soul. Like everything is in integrated wholeness. So there's no separation. And at that point, yeah, there really isn't. You've seen through the illusions and it's your your, your experience is different of things, right? But to, to to hope that you're like would have that is also to like reject the nature of where you are, which is like would just precipitate more suffering. And so I sort of speak about this delicately, knowing of the, the, the path and knowing that like we don't want to create this idealism of like you needing to be somewhere where you're not. Right. Because then it's just a performance. It's like a projection. And the spiritual ego is harder to see through <laughs> than than so to speak the human ego. Uh, and I would say the distinction is there is like there's these qualities and attributes of the spiritual ego that are more in the light. And uh, so it's like harder to see through that than it is uh, the nature of like the shadow, right? Because like, of course, like no one really enjoys being around someone who's like very contracted, you know, like anger, fear, sadness, guilt, all of those things. And yet at the same time, like those are what teach us everything about the light. So uh, <laughs> there's really value in the wholeness of everything. And uh, part of this whole process is being able to accept all things as it is, just the way it is, and feel it all. And everyone's path is unique because the nature of like their dream world and the nature of their small T trauma and their large T trauma, um, yeah, is, is distinctly uh, unique to them and their interpretation. Even two siblings, uh, you know, I have an identical twin <laughs> brother who is a mirror twin fascinating enough so i'm right-handed he's left-handed and our traumas were very mirroring of the way we handled it he entered in more of a, like initially a functional freeze and i entered into a fight you know and so it was like uh staring back at like the opposite ends of the pole of course like uh needing to ride back at the divine center but i sort of have to go through both paths <laughs> uh and so that's that's sort of the tricky part uh is you know from my experiences, it was it was easier to sort of like dive into the nature of uncomfortability because of the nature of like how my nervous system handled it. I became very familiar with the fighting. So chaos or stimulation or anything like that was just what I thought to be normal and safe. And I see that in a lot of like entrepreneurs. Um, it's like they've had a lot of pain and they move forward into the nature of the world, like trying to create a sense of healing. And that is uh, part of their own path. And it was part of my own path along entrepreneurship as well. And then you sort of like have to come back to the nature of like a recalibration or reorientation to this, uh, which is a little bit tricky. Um, there is like an integration of like, you know, most of us are motivated by our pain. <laughs> and then, like you said at the beginning of the podcast, just like, you know, to dive into love is, you know, very different than to dive into the nature of fear. People are very intimate. And as you become intimate and familiar with something, you just think that that's the way the world is. And so to operate in the world through love is different than to operate through fear. And so there is a huge integration process because you're no longer motivated to move away from pain, right? So like, how do you operate? Yes. And how do you operate in something so vast when you're used to something so limited? Yes. Right. Fear gives you limited choices. Love gives you infinite choices. Yes. Right. So there's just such a difference in how you approach it. Yes. And for those who don't know what small T trauma and large T trauma mm -hmm. is, can you navigate through that and how you know about small T trauma and big T trauma and what it means to you in your daily life? Yes. Yes. Yeah, I think, you know, uh, Dr. Gabin Mate like, explains this uh, in one of his recent uh, publications and something that's been kind of discussed more openly. 
as of late, and I would say large T trauma is really the order of magnitude, right, versus small T trauma, and the nature of how our autonomic nervous system changes as a result of that magnitude. So you don't ever really experience the same experience again in the same way because of that large T trauma. And it can be, that's what defines it, right? And we have all these other labels that we put on it, like PTSD, CPTSD. Um, all of those things are just a representation that the nature of the nervous system still has a lot of unprocessed sensations, right? that it hasn't been able to feel fully. And the depth of that and the magnitude really determined by a couple of variables. So like the timing at which it occurs. So the younger that child is or baby or infant or, you know, teenager or adult would determine the order of magnitude. Because you really have like this sort of like relationship having of interdependence. So the organism has a certain capacity to handle sort of stressors, meaning the unknown. And so if someone who's very young, be it of a, you know, a very young age, like four or five years old, three years old, six years old, their nervous system is very underdeveloped, right? So the ability to like feel something of a high order of magnitude, such as like sexual trauma or like physical violence or abuse is of a high order of magnitude, right? Because that organism just doesn't have the ability to adapt. And they also don't have any sort of like nature of perspective. Everything that happens is like a direct result of them, they think. Yeah. Whereas like when you're older, you can kind of like put into perspective the different orientations of what might have taken place and you have an ability to perceive. That's a lot of the development of the brain psychology. And so the prefrontal cortex and all of this helps us like actually have a shift out of like it's sort of like um, thinking it was all our fault. Um, but like young trauma like that doesn't really have that capacity. So both the nature of the organism and the magnitude of it, and then, you know, the depth and breadth of it. So how much did it happen over many years? Was it a single event? And then just your sort of interplay with that. So was there a huge degree of resistance? There's a huge degree of reaction, right? Uh, it's going to magnify that. And that's partly to do with the nature of, at that age, it's going to be more your authentic nature. <laughs> so we could go down that road just a little bit here. Uh, the We all sort of have a different nature, similar to like the way animals have a, a specific nature. And because animals don't have like a, a mind uh, or an egoic structure, they do have emotions, they have thoughts. Uh, but a mind is sort of like this nature of like a projection of the future or the past or lenses of perceptions or beliefs. Uh, they, they don't have that. They do have conditioning, that, especially domesticated animals. They don't have like the nature of the mind. So they can be always in the eternal now or the present now. And so that's why like dogs are like a good representation of unconditional love. And so to play off that, you know, like a snow dog would be a representation of, of like an authentic nature of just like really more of a fighter, right? Someone that the orientation of the nervous system is a little bit stronger on the sort of sympathetic normal set point of healthy. Whereas like a mastiff would be the opposite of that side of the spectrum where their set point is more on the parasympathetic side. Uh, and these are all spectrums, so there's really not binary. The mind likes to think in binary terms, and really everything in reality is relative in a spectrum. And so you might see those at two ends of the polar opposite. So the ability for that nature of, like, say, a baby that was more of that orientation, like what Ayurvedic might say is like a pitta body type, uh, whereas like inherently they're more fiery, more likely to resist, more likely to fight, is going to have a higher order of magnitude of, of trauma inside more relative to the nature of like a mastiff which is like more of a kapha type where it's like higher higher degrees of like set point in the parasympathetic which is essentially to receive the moment you know uh and so that different authentic nature is where things are a little bit different in terms of the nature of like why two people of the same orientation might have experienced trauma differently and so all of this sort of relates back to the nature of a large T trauma, but to speak to your point in terms of like small T trauma, 
is uh, something everyone experiences. And so there really is no uh, difference. And that's why like a lot of the spiritual self-realization path is like, oh, life has suffering. It's because we all sort of have this shared experience of that where something just doesn't feel right, doesn't seem right. Um, and that's more with the development of separation, uh, which is a form of the small T trauma. Part of this is like magnified uh, in the nature of domestication. So small T trauma and domestication is like your parents are essentially loving you as the way they were loved. And so they're doing always the best that they can based on their own experience of that, no matter what it is. And I would just go as far as to say that that's actually always the case for people. Um, <laughs> and I know that there's probably a challenge of really accepting that, but uh, it, it is really just the case. Like if people actually knew the truth, <laughs> they they would uh, not actually see it the other way. And that's why I think like the saying when Jesus was like hung on the cross is one of the most accurate sayings. It's like, when he said, uh, forgive them for they know not what they do, uh, he didn't say forgive them for they know what they do, right? right? And that distinction was a very important distinction, right? Meaning that the unconscious behaviors that they were carrying out was just an inability to understand the full self-realization and that when you harm someone else, you're harming yourself. And so he was able to stay in the nature of compassion and openness and love. Because he knew that anything of closure, contraction, or fear was would, would ultimately hurt him and then carry over to hurt others as well. So it was a form of alchemy, a form of transmutation because of all of the self-realization that he had done. And despite the sensations of being nailed to the cross and just like being crucified and all of that, which like from the primitive side of the mind would be like, well, how could you? <laughs> you know, uh, the reaction is like love is accepting all things as it is, just the way it is, right? So his nervous system had been able to receive, like his heart was wide open. But even he yeah. went through a time where he had to come to the acceptance of that, which yes. I think is very important. Yes, the process. Like, <laughs> even those who have this big L love, it doesn't keep from the process. Yes. And yes. that, I feel, helps people understand, like, no matter where we are on our journey, there's still moments because it's kind of holds in on itself. We're mm -hmm. all there. And so how do you navigate the process is the key. Yes. How do you stay open enough to navigate the process instead of contracting? Yes. Right? Exactly. That just goes to the trauma discussion, right? The big T, little T. And you had mentioned death by a thousand cuts, right? Yes. Or, so. Yeah, and that's the way I think most people discredit their own pain and suffering is, you know, they see uh, the, the order of magnitude of someone else's and then they're like, oh, well, I didn't experience that. It's like, well, most abuse, 98, 99% <laughs> is done by ourselves, right? And mm -hmm. so like we come across the nature of like what has been done to us, we absorb that into the nature of our consciousness, our nervous system, and that gives way to the pattern of thinking that we identify as self. And then the ability to like work through all of that is really the path towards healing. And so the ability is to meet ourselves exactly where we are, right? And so that's part of where like, I think religion goes, you know, a little off uh, is, is what you're speaking to, right? Is like this, this idea that we need to be somewhere where we're not. And then people start trying to project in the nature of the mind, yeah. right? And so, yeah, the, that, that was actually spoken to. <laughs> A little bit in terms of like the worshiping of like a false deity or a golden calf and like jesus never intended for that to take place uh in fact it was very representative of just the nature of his whole path like he was like born supposedly as a jew right and then like ended up as a christian and like he wasn't really like he didn't care necessarily about the identification of anything identification is in the nature of the mind right it's sort of an egoic construct where we hide behind as a way of like projecting so we don't have to accept all of ourselves and to feel all of ourselves. And so the nature of the process is all we have, right? Because the process is the uh, eternal now, right? To, to be anywhere where you are not yeah. is to be in this sort of orientation towards an outcome or a nature of an identification. So that's where all suffering lies. And so that's where like, you know, of course, like, you know, learning about these things is part of that process, you know, and as we learn, sometimes the judge becomes stronger and like, oh, we should be something other, we should be compassionate in this moment. 
and uh, that that's part of the recognition the piece to go back to is like as you do like practices like meditation or practices like breath work or things that help us expand the nature of moving from a reaction to a response is where that sort of increases in our ability to choose right that's part of the nature of like awakening and you know the self-realization is that uh, the nature of a time is actually a, a mental construct in the mind and so we dissolve part of that time component through these practices and it sort of time dilates expands and you can see this in the nature of like psychedelics or you can see in the nature of near-death experiences right time dilates is it really time dilating or mind changing in terms of interpretation of things and that we would say is more the latter right so those are tools or those are things that happen but what's happening is actually the letting go of that lens of perception of like time right and so it all collapses and so it appears that everything's slowing or like moving into like the eternal now but really that's just the dissolving of the lens of perception <laughs> austin right? and i talk about yeah. it i experience yeah. time very differently mm -hmm. quite often than yes. he does yes. and so it's interesting how relative time actually is Yes. We hold so much to it. Yes. But again, it's making certain that we have everything in our little compartments so that we can go through a day in that compartmentalized fashion. Yes. Which is so important for the mind. Yeah. Not necessarily for the soul, which is why even with faith or religion, it's important until it's not important. Mm -hmm. Right. All things are important until they're not important. At what point and how do you get to the different stages for them to not be important is really what you're speaking to and that flow of love, right? Yes. So, yeah, the, the love piece is like, um, and this is probably where some of the tricky part is like, uh, the more we have alignment, right, with the nature of the, the greater universe, the Tao, uh, Sort of my background in Chinese medicine would speak more to that. Then the nature is like uh, everything just spontaneously arises when it when it should. Um, and so if we live from the constructs of the mind, which is just like organizational principle of like okay, we're going to construct our day in the nature of like what we think to be the right timing is is in the more misaligned that is with the the authentic self, right? Uh, sort of going to suffer more. Right. So, like, you could look at this in terms of shift work. Right. So, people, of course, can construct anything in the layer of the mind. <laughs> so, like, you can ignore the nature of somatic sensations you start to experience. And I think the increase in chronic disease is like 60 to 70 percent in shift work, people who work in the night shift. And of course, you could say, well, this is my schedule. This is what I'm going to do. And you're, you're still trying to find uh, safety at the layer of the mind. And you're constructing the nature of reality outside of any sort of understanding of connectivity to the whole right so there has to be this understanding of both interdependence meaning sort of this connection to the greater whole and intradependence meaning your connection to self uh, inwardly and then the nature of architecture is where those sort of like align so that and obviously can be a lot for a lot of people to digest and process but like part of love, you know, of course I gave the definition accepting all things as it is, just the way it is. But an extension of that is really like alignment. Uh, so, and that alignment comes from the speaking of truth, right? Meaning your authentic truth, uh, not from the nature of the mind. Um, so like children, you know, that's why I like had the whole show of like kids say the darnest things, like you can't really get a kid to lie. Yeah. <laughs> they actually just speaking from the authentic self. So that's you know, if you want a representation, hang around the child, right? They're actually speaking from that place. Like yeah. we forget that place or if we, we lose all connection with it and we're all speaking from the nature of the mind until we arrive back there. And then it's like, oh, well, that was simple. Like I just had to speak the truth. <laughs> so, so in many ways, like uh, this is like one of the comical things as you like heal and unwind is like we realize like we created so much suffering and complexity, moving away something that was so simple, right? And so this is part of that process. And just to reiterate, kind of like go circle back around the small T trauma, because I think we didn't give enough color and illumination to it. Uh, 
is that the nature of small T trauma is in fact what we discussed a little bit earlier in the podcast in terms of like how does this come about? And it comes about in the nature of discrepancy between the authentic self, which the child is in, meaning feeling and experiencing, and then the parent comes and they don't really accept them exactly as they are or acknowledge that they're feeling that way, or they invalidate that they're feeling that way. And through that is the beginning of jumping into the uh, false self. So the false self is simply another mirror. <laughs> uh, so that's why like everything's a mirror. The false self is what we're dissolving into the authentic self. And so the false self would be sort of the egoic structure. And these are all just interchangeable words. Uh, and that is the nature of our personality. And so the differentiating component there is the authentic self does have preferences, just like the nature of the dog that we were talking about earlier. Um, the snow dog would prefer to actually be really hardworking and kind of like continue to like explore new frontiers. And that's just his nature. For it to be anything other is to move away from its nature. And uh, thankfully, like unless it's domesticated or misaligned, like it, it really can't like it'll continue to be its nature. And for us living within the constructs of the nature of the world of reality is like depending on how far away from our nature that we have a change or shift in the personality or ego structure determines how big that small t trauma is. So let's just say going back to the analogy of like the mastiff and you're like very kind of like more of a relaxed state like and you're born into like a family that's like parents happen to be both like pitta or like snow dogs and like really high achievement and you're like what's this all about? <laughs> You know, uh, essentially, like your degree of small t trauma is going to be super high and super wide because that domestication process is going to be super misaligned um, in terms of like your authentic self versus like how constructed. And, you know, the domestication process is oftentimes we domesticate in the nature of withholding love. So it's like, you know, you go and do something. And all of a sudden your dad's scolding you or your mom's scolding you and like where they're not happy. And like we learn to please another person or appease to another person as a way of trying to get them to open back their heart so we can feel safe opening our heart. Right. But but truthfully, like that's part of seeing past this piece is the healing is that we can actually, as long as we're staying within our authentic nature, we don't need to do that. Um, but we have to actually go through the dissolving of that illusion, which is a very strong illusion that most of us are under in terms of the domestication process. And so that's where the small T trauma starts to really build up, you know, because let's say your parents does this every day. You start doing this every day for you. And your relationship to self at that point is one of rejection, and you feel highly motivated by rejection. And so this carries on in your life, and you may actually practice that through your achievements, through academia, through the nature of like even exercise, right? So you get people who are really constantly punishing themselves as a way of moving forward, and they can't ever arrive at a place of like wholeness because you can't progress further unless you punish yourself further. And it's like the relationship to that process is the problem. It's not the actual thing itself. But in order to like unwind that would be to have to dissolve that whole thing, right? So it's just like too much for people, right? And so instead, you know, if you had a love relationship, it might start slower, might be a little bit more organic in the nature of like coming versus like the really stark pull of like rejection where it's like a fear response, right? Yeah. It's like a trigger to yourself. I really need to do this. And it feels like you're moving really fast towards your goal quote unquote, whatever that is, which is the projection of the mind. <laughs> uh, there's really nowhere to go. Um, but that's what you think will make you feel safe, right? Or feel loved by the nature of your projection of reality of self and others. And so it's a unwinding of that and a recognition that's not the case. And that and that's why like most things are insatiable along that path. Well they are, because you can't ever get there. Because you're actually in the process of self-rejection, the whole process. And the deeper you go and the more you achieve, you're still in that process. 
Where it's like if you're in the nature of love, you can keep going and it's enduring and it's expansionary and uh, you're honoring your authentic self through the whole way. Yeah. So that's why, again, speak to one of the statements that said earlier, like everything at the end changes, but nothing changes at all. Like it's just your relationship to those things, yourself and others, that changes. And so your experience of all of it changes. And so it just becomes like, yeah, a move from an orientation of fear into this orientation of love, which is accepting all things as it is, just the way it is. It's an alignment with truth of the authentic self. And with that comes the ability to spontaneously arise and speak exactly to wherever you are. And that makes you feel safe all the time, right? And so that's the differentiating component there. But yeah, it's a, a lot of this is tricky because like we've become so intimate to the nature of living through the mind. And that's what precipitates all fear, which is the false self, which is this sense of separation. And the idea that like, oh, the body's having some sort of different experience seems impossible to us, uh, but it actually is until we get back to it, which is, again, a child isn't. It's fully integrated, like born enlightened and sort of like in that state up until the point of small T trauma and or large T trauma and or the combination. People with large T trauma also have small T trauma. Like it's yeah. just a- It all accumulates. Yes, exactly. Thank you for joining us on this episode of the Heart Leader Podcast, where our heart and our mind align. We were so grateful to have Dr. Crest join us in this discussion, and he'll be around for part two next week, where we discuss the parallels between entrepreneurship and the spiritual journey. It's an episode you will not want to miss. 